right, well, welcome to Midweek Connection, and it's actually end of the week connection today because it is Friday, the 25th of August. We're here at First Presbyterian Church. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Pastor Natalie. And we are going to read our daily lectionary text for today and talk about it and see what insights we might be able to glean. But we do trust it's the Holy Spirit that does all these things, so let's go to Him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you have given to us and continue to give to us. Uh, through your word and through your um, speaking to us in your word. Uh, So I ask, Lord, today that as we read these texts today and discuss them, that you would help to uh, transform us into the people that we uh, were created by you to be, uh, increasingly transformed into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. So bless this time, Lord, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Today we are going to start with Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. And from Psalm 148, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his host. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters in all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind, fulfilling his command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. Our Hebrew scripture reading today is from 2 Samuel chapter 19, and it's from verses 24 through 43. Mephibosheth, grandson of Saul, came down to meet the king. He had not taken care of his feet, or trimmed his beard, or washed his clothes from the day the king left until the day he came back in safety. When he came from Jerusalem to meet the king, the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth. He answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me, for your servant said to him, Saddle a donkey for me, so that I may ride on it and go with the king, for your servant is lame. He has slandered your servant to my lord the king, but my lord the king is like the angel of God. Do therefore what seems good to you, for all my father's house were doomed to death before my lord the king, but you set your servant among those who eat at your table. What further right have I, then, to appeal to the king? The king said to him, Why speak any more of your affairs? I have decided. You and Ziba shall divide the land. Mephibosheth said to the king, Let him take it all, since my lord the king has arrived home safely. Now Barzillai the Gileadite had come down from Roeglin, and he went on with the king to the Jordan to escort him over the Jordan. Barzillai was a very aged man, eighty years old. He had provided the king with food while he stayed at Mahanaim, for he was a very wealthy man. The king said to Barzillai, Come over with me, and I will provide for you in Jerusalem at my side. But Barzillai said to the king, How many years have I still to live that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? Today I am eighty years old. Can I discern what is pleasant and what is not? Can your servant taste what he eats or what he drinks? Can I still listen to the voice of singing men and singing women? Why then should your servant be an added burden to my lord the king? Your servant will go a little way over the Jordan with the king. Why should the king recompense me with such a reward? 
please let your servant return, so that I may die in my own town, near the graves of my father and my mother. But here is your servant Shimhem. Let him go over with my lord the king, and do for him whatever seems good to you. The king answered, Shimhem shall go over with me, and I will do for him whatever seems good to you, and all that you desire of me I will do for you. Then all the people crossed over the Jordan, and the king crossed over. The king kissed Barzillai and blessed him, and he returned to his own home. The king went on to Gilgal, and Shimhem went with him, all the people of Judah. And also half the people of Israel brought the king on his way. Then all the people of Israel came to the king and said to him, Why have our kindred, the people of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king and his household over the Jordan and all David's men with him? All the people of Judah answered the people of Israel, Because the king is near of kin to us, why then are you angry over this matter? Have we eaten at all at the king's expense, or has he given us any gift? But the people of Israel answered the people of Judah, We have ten shares in the king, and in David also we have more than you. Why then did you despise us? Were we not the first to speak of bringing back our king? But the words of the people of Judah were fiercer than the words of the people of Israel. And from Acts chapter 24, verse 24, into chapter 25, um, to verse 12 there. Some days later, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him speak concerning faith in Christ Jesus. And as he discussed justice, self-control, and the coming judgment, Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present. When I have an opportunity, I will send for you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul, and for that reason, he used to send for him very often and converse with him. After two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and since he wanted to grant the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priest and the leaders of the Jews gave him a report against Paul. They appealed to him and requested as a favor to them against Paul to have him tr transfer to Jerusalem. They were, in fact, planning an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So, he said, let those of you who have the authority come down with me, and if there is anything wrong about the man, let them accuse him. After he had stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea. The next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he arrived, the Jews who had gone down from Jerusalem surrounded him, bringing many serious charges against him, which they could not prove. Paul said in his defense, I have in no way committed an offense against the law of the Jews, or against the temple, or against the emperor. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, asked Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and be tried there before me on these charges? Paul said, I am appealing to the emperor's tribunal. This is where I should be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as you very well know. Now, if I am in the wrong and have committed something for which I deserve to die, I am not trying to escape death. But if there is nothing to their... Page stuck together. <laughs> if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can turn me over to them. I appeal to the emperor. Then Festus, after he had conferred with his council, replied, you have appealed to the emperor. To the emperor you will go. Our gospel reading today is from Mark chapter 12, and it starts in verse 35. While Jesus was teaching in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David calls himself Lord, so how can he be his son? And the large, sorry, David calls him, David himself calls him Lord, sorry. So how can he be his son? And the large crowd was listening to him with delight. As he taught, uh, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses, 
and for the sake of appearance say long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then Jesus called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put everything, put in everything she had, all she had to live on. And back to our Psalms, Psalm 32. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And our final psalm today is Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I tried to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil, do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. So, yeah, some different uh, different stories okay. today. Uh, ones that probably don't get preached on regularly. Like, I can't remember ever preaching anything from Second Samuel chapter 19. <laughs> Right. Oh, maybe we should have done this on Wednesday, right? There was a little bit more <laughs> on the David and the Absalom stuff. But right. uh, so I kind of, 
I kind of think like what what to do with this and uh, just to put things in context if you have not been keeping up with your daily lectionary reading um, in 2 Samuel there had been uh, the conflict between David's son Absalom and David and David had to flee because Absalom had uh, he had man fa manipulated, manipulated and the people's favor child. was on him right. the crowds had turned the crowds are turning as David, so David flees, and so the war has been won. Uh, David's army defeated Absalom's army. Absalom is dead. Uh, David has mourned for the death of his son, and now David is returning to Jerusalem, and so it's this kind of, uh, you know, what's the word for that? Just kind of the, the, the closing of a scene, I guess, and so some of the conflict that David had had with people along the way and and encounters that he had with people as he's fleeing now it's kind of a uh, restoration time and I think what we're seeing in both of these is the mercy that David extends even to people that were not as loyal as they could have been um, but Mephi uh, Mephibosheth is Saul's uh, one of Saul's sons and I think he might be the last surviving son uh, and the, that line in there that he, that was a grandson, right? Um, he hadn't taken care of his feet or trimmed his beard or washed his clothes. And so clearly he had already been welcomed into David's house. David had to flee. And even Saul's grandson um, is mourning his loss. And so this kind of welcome back thing. But then this Barzillai, uh, yeah, when's the last time you read about Barzillai, right? You know, it's, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's okay. just today. Uh, you know, old man uh, who had fed David along the way as he's escaping, and now David's trying to pay him back, and it's like, I'm just kind of an old man, just yeah. but doing maybe, my thing. But doing my thing. Well, you know, maybe I don't, it doesn't identify who Chimam is, does it? But, uh, Maybe maybe a grandson of Barzillai, right. you know. Maybe there's uh, maybe one of Barzillai's servants, you know. Barzillai think, well, I'm probably gonna die soon. Let's just see how this benefit can be passed on to somebody else. So, um, I, I wish I had more on that. Uh, there's obviously still a little tension between Israel and Judah. Uh, the ten tribes that are called Israel, and then Judah and Benjamin were the loyal tribes to David. Um, and so there's a little bit going on here. Well, he's our king. Well, no, he's really our king. And it's like, well, can't he be our king? And, you know, but we will see that this division that occurs after David's death is along those lines between those 10 tribes that are called Israel and those two tribes that are called Judah. Um, and so it's a foreshadow of some tension to come. So even as magnanimous as David could be in his mercy and in his restoration, there's still going to be conflict. Right. Yeah. And I, I don't have anything more to say on that. So. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that? It was like, right, right. Who's, who's Barzilla? Yeah, right. Uh, or Barzilla. 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 It's not, I don't know. It's just kind of, yeah. Yeah. Um, so. So then the Acts passage with Paul, he's, he's been arrested he was arrested in Jerusalem. He's been taken into Roman custody because the Romans don't like other people killing them. That's that's their job, right? right. You know, they reserve it. Um, but we see, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by when Jesus, uh, not Jesus, when Paul is talking to Felix and Paul starts talking about Jesus and justice and self-control and the coming judgment was to say Felix became frightened. Right. Okay, so, but remember, he's the big, tough Roman governor and he's not supposed to be frightened of anybody, especially these backwater Jews and this right. and the other thing, but there's clearly some, you know, it's, it's we, we've talked before about the difference between conviction and then repentance people can feel convicted right but they don't always repent like when Herod killed John the Baptist but right. um, so I'm wondering if Felix is kind of the same way man you're kind of freaking me out with this but we're just not going to talk about it anymore right I don't want to I don't want to talk about maybe my lack of lack of um, self-control and and 
justice and whatnot. Let's just not acknowledge the mm. elephant in the room. Um, you know, I don't know. Maybe it struck a little too close to home. I, it probably did. I was uh, reading something a friend of mine wrote not too long ago, and she had said something to the effect of, uh, especially in this political season that we're in, and everybody's talking about this and talking about that, and she wrote, how can we uh, pursue Christian ideas through unchristian behavior? And I was like, uh, uh, very sad right you know Paul is talking about Jesus and people are like yeah I like justice I like self-control but you know what as long as, as somebody long as, else has to do it as long as, well, right if it, as long. if it if it changes me then I'm not so much interested in that right. especially people in positions of power and authority right mm -hmm. so all this mm, appealing to the emperor and the Jews trying to accuse them and all of this stuff. Um, I've always, when I read the final chapters of Acts, I kind of think about how Paul is still a participant in these things, but he's no longer the, uh, it's almost as if his agency gets taken away. He's, he's, you know, he's captive, he's bound. Um, people are moving him around, all that kind of stuff. But how does he continue to be consistent with his message? He continues to talk about Jesus. He's not trying to escape death. Right. He is just appealing to the emperor, and as is his right as a Roman citizen. Um, you know, I, yeah. I, it's just kind of you know this consistency of Paul even has as his own agency is increasingly limited, and I just kind of think about that for for any of us. Um, we. You know, not in the not in the United States or anything, but we aren't um, imprisoned for our faith. But there are people around the world who are right, and that they do suffer. I mean, beatings and right. you know, they suffer physical punishment and harm for that. And mm -hmm. um, you know, he's yet imprisoned again. And I think history, you know, his experience tells him, you know. He's, lots of things have happened, and so this might not end is, well for him physically. Right, right, and with that, um, he just speaks truth. Mm. He continues to do that, um, even as, like you said, it seems almost as if his authority is being taken from him. Um, right, but the message in the gospel is still the same, regardless. Right, right. so. So I was going to make kind of a, a slight shift in the sense that, at least in the United States, we aren't imprisoned for our faith, but I wonder uh, what limitations might we experience, but then are we consistent with the message of the gospel, even in the midst of our limitations? And, you know, there are people in our community that, uh, you know, through accident or through age are limited in mobility are uh, in assisted living or in hospitals and their their capacity is diminishing but uh, do they continue being consistent in faith and how and how even do we as people in the church uh, try to encourage them and I know one thing that I regularly do when I go to visit people is, I share, a, I share a prayer request with them. I ask them to consider other people in prayer and, right. to, and to give them opportunities to do that. Um, I, you know, I don't do it every time, but I think that's something that is good for them to remember. They have a capacity to engage with the gospel even if their own situations are, have changed. Right, and... And as you have invited me to go to some visitations, I hadn't really even thought about that. And, and I know that we've gone out to those people, but how can those people still maintain some sense that they are still part of the community? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, that's... And then us as members of the community, how can we... How can we recognize that they are still part of the community? Right. Right, I, I think about in you know, Matthew 25 when Jesus is talking about the sheep and the goats and 
you know, we didn't read it today, but about, you know, you visited me when, when I was in prison. And I think, again, for when Jesus' time, that was a very literal thing. Right. People were imprisoned. Uh, but I still think that there are uh, times that, are, again, our capacities have greater and greater constraints put around them. How can we visit with people uh, to, to loose them from those bonds? Um, yeah. Well, and I think coming, you know, that's, that's interesting. I know we're not in the whole COVID realm anymore. But that isolation, you know, now we can look at that as our homebound, but even the last few years with things. And I know there are still people that are still much more isolated from, by choice or by medical whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, that isolation in and of itself could be a prison. I mean, when we think about, yeah, that, when I think about that, I mean, yeah. There's a lot of fear out there still. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the isolation, the, uh, the loneliness. It could, it could feel like you're in prison. Even yeah. if you're free to come and go. <clears throat> right. Um, and I think, I think that is something that struck um, with a lot of our young people mm-hmm. that were at some critical ages and things like that and I think there may be some long term you know effects of that whatever not to get into that too much but yeah that that um, yeah just interesting I hadn't really thought about that from the perspective of that isolation being a prison and um, and yet I think yeah I could see where that is so you know as we are regularly reminded our text today didn't necessarily address that particular issue, but I think uh, one of the advantages of familiarity with the text and and how ideas can spring to mind. um, Yeah, Uh, if we jump back over to Mark, um, David, um, Jesus is answering this question or asking a question about David and so all about even, you know, we've been reading in 2 Samuel and David has a multiplicity of sons and from a variety of wives that he has and concubines that he's taken over the course of his, his, of his kingship. Um, but then, so uh, Jesus asks the scribes the question, how can, you know, there's a, there seems to be a weird temporal shift. There's a, a positional, right. not, not even an ambiguity where, um, David is acknowledging that the Messiah, who is all prophesied to come from the line of David, mm-hmm. actually precedes David. And so it is it is complicated to think about, and I think this is where uh, Jesus is uh, demonstrating, again, who he is and how, yes, Jesus incarnate came into a specific time and a specific place but he has always existed. Mm -hmm. He is the second person of the Trinity, uh, the Son of God. Um, And so his pre-existence prior to incarnation, David himself recognizes that. I know that the Messiah, though born of me down the line, does precede me. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. it's interesting because it says, you know, the large crowd was listening to him with delight. I know in the last couple of weeks I've been talking about the crowd and sometimes right. the crowd can be, yeah, you know, that's a great point. You know, they don't necessarily believe in Jesus, but right. they love the, the uh, repartee that's going on between Jesus and these scribes and Pharisees. And, but it doesn't, you know, the, uh, and then he comes around with that verses, you know, 38 through 40 and, Um, uh, whenever Jesus makes a critique about religious leaders Mm -hmm. I think that the the spirit of the critique is still necessary today and it's it's a substantial warning that don't don't take a position of spiritual authority 
for your own good <laughs> or right. your right. own mm-hmm. material benefit or whatever it might happen to be you know take a take a take a position of spiritual authority and do like Jesus did and serve serve ultimately die to self mm-hmm. um, because again you know uh, I, I think it's the natural human endeavor we get a little taste of power and we like it we, right so, so best seats in the synagogue places of honor at the banquet advantage of those beneath us um, right put on a shiny appearance right yeah and, isn't that great um, though that for the sake of appearance they say long prayers that's going to be short well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. Um, or even uh, what was it? Is it is it in the uh, the Eugene Peterson book that uh, that we have both read recently? The working the angles. I know it's an older book, but his concept of prayer, and I think one of the things is the prayer should always be the second word. Yes. Uh, that God is the one who initiates. God is the one who's the primary actor, the primary agent. He. He starts the conversation, and then our prayers are in response to him, not the not the starting gun of an event just to get our thing going, which mm-hmm. is so often what prayers are, uh, but a response in, uh, in in obedient submission, but still in conversation with God. It's right, and we're we're not calling him into the conversation; he's already called yes. and invited us. We are our prayers. Are that communication in our response and our opportunity to listen and, and engage in something he has already right initiated right um, yeah how, how have you been with that recently Natalie but prayer in general yeah, well, prayer or prayer is the second word is the second word well in that same book and I, I shared this with Joel the other day but it talks about you know the power of prayer and, and the words of prayer and how do we recognize the power of prayer? Do we recognize the the weight of prayer? And so I will say I definitely, my prayers have been, I've looked at them differently mm-hmm. ever since reading that. And um, in, like I said, you're not calling him into this conversation. Oh, I'm here and I'm ready for you. No, he's already... Um, so yeah, it, it's definitely a different, a different. Um, <laughs> Thanks for answering that question. I know I didn't answer that very well, did I? No, no, it's good. I don't know, but did it? So when you read that, did it change the way that you pray? Well, that, well actually, I have tried uh, when I've made adjustments to my quiet time in the mm-hmm. sense that I try to do my reading of God's word first and then pray. As okay. opposed to just starting, you know, I do pray throughout the day. I know I do. It's an right. ongoing thing, but my prayers are, you know, cries for mercy a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Just prayers for prayers for aid to get through the day. Uh, when I think of people that you know they come to my mind, and so I will pray for them right then and there. But in terms of um, in terms of remembering that it's God who's speaking to us, God speaking to me through his word, being more diligent with reading his word first and then offering my prayers. And often then it, it, they take on, um, well, you know, it's not, it's not even urgency. They take on uh, an expectation that God's the one that's at work anyway. And right. so if I've come across something challenging, it's like, well, God, you worked through these people and in these people to accomplish your purposes, and I know you still do the same today. And so when I pray for people that I know are going through some difficulties, it's more with expectation now and, and even hope um, and, and confidence that God's got it. Right. Um, and then it's, it's, it's interesting. I see... Um, I then I then look for a response. I look for and and I see stuff sometimes, and I'm like, how, how did I, miss that? Wow, I have that's been praying. Pretty cool, right? I have been praying. Show me, 
Mm. Open my eyes. Right. right. Open my heart. Show me. Instead of me just forge ahead. Like, I got this. Mm. No. Um, I've spent a lot of time, a lot of time, um, asking for that and to help with just reveal, mm. reveal, um, Right, so in a way, it's almost like that my prayer wasn't answered, but I see something going on. I'm like, oh, well, isn't that, isn't that fascinating? Right. Um, and so I don't want people to get the idea that, you know, oh, when, when I pray, like when Joel prays, Joel gets what he asked for. And it's just like, well, no, I'm observing what God is doing right. and hopefully participating in that. And then, and then it becomes well. Now, what's what's the next step, Lord? Right. How how do I see and observe something, and and I pray about it, and it's like, Lord, what what is it you want me to do to next? Now. Yes. Um, what? Yeah. Yes. Open doors. Um, right. How can I live into what it is right. that you're right. asking me to do? Right. How? Because I didn't I... even expect that to happen. And so now it's like, okay, let's go in that how let's can go. I how, how can I fit into this? How right, do I, right, right, right. what role do I play right. in what you're doing? Right. So the answer really becomes, well, here's your next thing, as opposed to, oh, yeah, that person was healed, because, you know, that sometimes happens. Or, right. you know, yeah, it's more, oh, well, here's our next step. And so if there's a little bit of freedom now, I think I'm feeling... And then, if that makes sense, it's, it does. Right. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank Thanks. you for asking. Right. That's a that was a little little sidebar little, there. Little excursion, uh, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, gosh, how you can't you know all the all the psalms today? Just yes. Let's just put them in that whole all the psalms box. You know, one thirty, one forty eight, thirty two, one thirty nine. Um, solid. Good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> it's, yes, it's good, good stuff. stuff. Uh, um, I'm still, I still get the contrast between most of 139 and the last few verses of it just still wrestle with me wrong. Um, but oh, that, yeah. that whole, uh, you know, oh, that you would kill the wicked. You know, right. like, oh, where did that come from? And then you remember that the Psalm 139 is. Um, is a psalm of David, and David is regularly wrestling with his responsibilities as king, his own sinful nature that still exists, uh, the complications of going to war against his own son, right. all that, right? Yeah. And so it's okay that the psalms are complicated. Right. Because you kind of catch that glimpse of, yeah, and then you go, oh, okay. I always struggle with that verse 22 in Psalm 139. I hate them with perfect hatred, mm -hmm. and I count them my enemies. <laughs> but right, we're supposed to pray for our enemies, though, right? But no, I hate them with perfect hatred. What is perfect hatred? Like, that one always gets me. I don't know what to do with that. Like, let's go back over here to all of my days. Or I was, you know, before I was ever, well, let's go back to that. Right. Because this is hard. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Perfect right. hatred. It's, it's, uh, it's certainly a contrast. But I, I, I think if we are all honest with ourselves, I think we can find ourselves in that, right? Oh, absolutely. Right. And I think, you know, we've talked about that. And I think that's why the Psalms resonate. Because no matter where you are at... There's a psalm for you. There is a psalm. There for is you. a psalm, and there's a psalm that um, there's a prayer that demonstrates whatever emotion it is that you're feeling. And um, it's lovely. It's lovely. It's just, even if I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> With perfect With hatred. Perfect hatred. Mm. Oh my goodness. Um, but yeah. it's but it is good stuff. I mean, it, it is. It's God is good. God is steadfast. God is the constant, even when we are bipolar. <laughs> I mean, for lack of a better word. Lack of a better word. Um, yeah. But I mean, He is. He is. Wonderful are your works. He Amen. is. 
He yeah. is. He is good. He is good. He is steadfast. Wherever we are, he is constant. So, let's, uh, let's end with that. Yeah, you know, ultimately, that. even if there's some weird thing in Scripture that you go, I don't understand the historical context. Okay, you know, read it. Be aware. Real people, real times. God is working in them historically. God is working in us today. And then just settle back on the Psalms. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, you want to close this in prayer? I would be happy Okay, awesome. Gracious Lord, thank you. Thank you for this time that we have together today, reading your word together. And I just pray that we hear these words. And even if we don't know exactly what to do with them, that um, we take them in and that we know that you are speaking to us through your scriptures. And I pray that we do look around and that we look and we seek and we search for you and the work that you do and that um, you invite us into that work and in that that we are allowed to love those around us better as we come closer to you and love you better um, show us your next step that you have for us help us to be transformed into the people that you would have us to be in jesus name we pray amen amen um this probably won't get posted until monday would be my guess but um, i hope y'all have a blessed weekend and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.